Hey, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing part two of eukaryotes. We've already done part one on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Mad Medicine, where we have a MCAT uh, biology playlist for you guys that you guys can watch for the MCAT. While you're there, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel because we're going to be posting these videos regularly so you guys can get a lot out of this content. With that being said, let's talk about the structure of this lecture. We've already gone over part one, which we covered general information and types of organelles. Today, we're going to be discussing the cytoskeleton as well as the high yield facts and questions. Let's talk about the cytoskeleton. The function of the cytoskeleton is to provide structure to the cell and help maintain its shape. It aids in the transport of materials around the cell, and you have three main components. You have the intermediate filaments, you have the microfilaments, and then you have microtubules, all of which are pretty high yield, pretty important, things you should definitely know. So let's just dive right into it. We have intermediate filaments, which are a group of diverse uh, uh, filamentous proteins that include keratin and desmin, and they're involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion or maintenance of the in overall integrity of the cytoskeleton. Essentially, I always considered intermediate filaments to be like the long bones in our body. Now, why is that the case? Well, I always considered them to be very strong uh, and and uh, allow our cells to maintain its structure and overall integrity. That's exactly what the long bones do. Those are very strong bones. They are uh, uh, powerful and they're able to resist a lot of tension and they allow us to maintain our structural support. So that's what I always thought about intermediate filaments to be like, like the long bones. They're able to withstand a tremendous amount of tension, making the cell structure Structure more rigid just like our long bones and they help anchor other org organelles together uh, not together sorry in their place including the nucleus this is very important because if you don't have intermediate filaments that function properly your organelles might not be in the right position right location and if they release their internal substances they can cause harm to their neighboring organelles which is very dangerous so you obviously want to have good intermediate filament activity occurring in your cells Microfilaments, on the other hand, are solid polymerized uh, rods of actin. Now, you guys might remember actin. We're going to talk about that in a second. But microfilaments provide protection for the cell because they're resistant to fracture and pressure. Now, actin is used in muscle contraction because it can use ATP to generate a force for movement along with the help of myosin. So you guys might remember actin myosin complexes with, uh, when it comes to uh, a contraction of muscles. Well, because of that, I always considered microfilaments to be like muscles, right? And I know you guys might be saying, like, what are you saying? Well, just hear me out for a second, right? Because you have actin, and uh, microfilaments are solid polymerized uh, rods of actin. Actin and myosin are very, very important when it comes to muscle components. So I always considered uh, 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 micro to, microfilaments excuse me, to be like muscles when it comes to the cytoskeleton. Essentially, the cytoskeleton is like your st skeletal structure, right? So you have your bones, which are your intermediate filaments. You have your muscles, which are your microfilaments. So that is what I considered and I equated microfilaments for. That's just a, lo a little trick I use to remember these boring-ass... Um, uh, content things you need to know now they definitely microfilaments definitely are uh, important because they also play a role in cytokinesis because they form the cleavage furrow during mitosis we're going to talk about mitosis a little bit more uh, in our upcoming videos but just definitely you should know that microfilaments are the main reason why you have the cleavage furrow occurring during my uh, uh, mitosis now, when it comes to microtubules, microtubules are hollow polymers of tubulin. How do I remember this? Well, pretty much the name gives it away. It's a tube, right? It's a microtubule. Well, a tube is a hollow, uh, it's a hollow rod, essentially. So therefore, microtubules are going to be hollow polymers of tubulin. And tubulin is easy to remember because it's in the name tubule. All right, so then microtubules play a primary uh, a role and uh, allow for primary pathway along which these non-enzymatic motor proteins are able to transport uh, uh, their their vesicles, their 
their uh, uh, weight that they need to transport, things they need to transport. And these proteins are kinesin and dynin. So let's talk about them a little bit. Kinesin carries stuff away from the cell body and dynin carries stuff towards the cell body. And this is actually pretty important. Uh, I know you guys may be thinking, well, well, why are you talking about this right now? This is like, you know, not really important. This is stupid. Well, it is important because, true story, uh, when I was in, in my second year of medical school, I got a question while I was studying about a infection, about a virus called herpes, HSV, herpes simplex virus. Now, you guys probably know what herpes is, right? Herpes is that virus that people get on their genitals, but it can also occur on their lips, and that is when you have cold sores. What you may not know is that herpes never leaves your body. Once you're infected by herpes, you have it for the rest of your life, and the way you have it for the rest of your life is that herpes goes and lies dormant in the ganglia of your neurons, pretty much in the cell bodies, and that's why we have this neural cell right here. Now, when you are in an immunocompromised state, what ends up happening is uh, your body is not able to suppress herpes not able to put it in check so herpes gets kind of crazy and says you know what what the hell I'm gonna go to the periphery I'm gonna go to the skin I'm gonna show myself and it does that by leaving the cell body and go uh, going down the axon and towards the skin towards the periphery well what proteins do you think it's using it's using microtubules specifically to uh, to show itself right in an immunocompromised state when herpes becomes active again it uses kinesin I'm going to write that here, kinesin to move away from the cell body where it's usually housed. So it goes down. And then when you, you know, get back into your normal structure, when your body goes back into its normal health, it puts herpes back in check. And it does that by using dynein. Uh, to push herpes all the way back to the cell body. And the easiest way I remembered it, it was with this saying, okay? You want to dine in the cell body, okay, with dynin. That is what I use to remember uh, what dynin and kinesin do. Dynin allows stuff to be carried back towards the cell body. Now, both of these, dynin and uh, uh, kinesin, pretty much make up the modal structures uh, in specifically microtubules, make up the modal structure of cilia and flagella. And cilia Flagella are very important for you guys. You guys should definitely know what they are. They come back in medical school. Uh, cilia are projections from a cell that primarily involve the movement of materials along the surface of the cell. This has nothing to do with the movement of the cell itself. It actually has to do with movement of other materials. So cilia is moving other materials. The cell is moving other materials. Now let's give a real world application. Cilia actually line the respiratory tract uh, and they're involved in movement of mucus. You, in your respiratory tract, guys, this is a side note, just listen so you have a good understanding. Uh, this is not going to pop up on your MCAT, I promise. In your respiratory tract, you have something called the mucociliary escalator. What ends up happening is when you get some bad stuff going down your lungs, which happens from once in a while, right? Maybe you're smoking, maybe you're near someone who's smoking, you get some, you know, uh, smoke down your lungs. Well, when it goes down your lungs, it gets trapped in mucus. Now, when it gets trapped in mucus, it does so, so it doesn't, the smoke or the toxic material doesn't affect your lungs. Now, that mucus that's entrapping the smoke or whatever toxin is in the mucus gets pushed up your respiratory tract, back up via the use of cilia that are in your respiratory tract. Hence why we call this the mucociliary ciliary escalator. Cilia is very important uh, for those reasons. And it's very important for you guys to understand that cilia doesn't have any uh, uh, role to play in the uh, actual movement of a cell. It has to play a role in movement of other things along the surface of a cell. Then you have flagella, which are structures that are involved in the movement of the cell itself. So when you're talking about sperm, uh, the flagella is what's helping sperm move through the, uh, through the reproductive tract. And this is what is uh, very, very important for movement. Both of these are actually composed of something called a 9 plus 2 structure. What this means is you have nine doublets with two central microtubules. Now, saying that is very easy, but you need to look at it because it's better to just understand what's happening by looking at a photo. This is an electron microscopic image of cilia or flagella. Actually, I don't know what this is, but this is the same for both. You have a nine plus two structure in both cilia and flagella. Right here, you have these nine doublets with two central 
uh, uh, microtubules within this nine uh, doublet ring on the outside. This is very important because this doesn't occur anywhere else. This really doesn't occur anywhere else. And it is something you should know when you see right away, you should be able to equate it to cilia and flagella, aka microtubules are what uh, is, com is comprising the structure. And you can see that these are hollow because you can see the hollow uh, center of these uh, microtubules. So that is pretty much all you need to know about the side of skeleton. These are just a little bit more photos for you guys to see. You can pause this slide and look at them. Not really important, just something I threw in there. Let's talk about high yield facts from the first video and this video. Number one, the nucleus contains the cell, uh, or con controls the cell, excuse me, via DNA. Very, very important. Mitochondria is a powerhouse of the cell. That's where ATP is generated, and it contains cytochrome C, which is an apoptotic, apoptotic uh, 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 enzyme, apoptotic uh, uh, mechanism in our body that can be released. Then you have lysosomes, which contain lysozymes, enzymes that are needed for the cleanup in our, our cells. You have peroxisomes that are similar to lysosomes, but contain hydrogen peroxide. They also play a huge role in production of phospholipids and uh, beta oxidation of very long chain fatty acids. I'm not writing this down. This is from our previous lecture, so go ahead and check that video out if you guys are a little bit lost. The endoplasmic reticulum is broken up into the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which creates proteins, and then the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which detoxifies, creates lipids, and actually shifts the proteins that the rough endoplasmic reticulum makes to the Golgi apparatus. And the difference between the two is that the rough endoplasmic reticulum has ribosomes on its surface. Then you have the Golgi apparatus, which modifies, repackages, and shifts the contents from the endoplasmic reticulum to the target location. And then when it comes to intermediate filaments, these are like the bones of the cell, the long bones of the cell. They're involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion and maintenance of overall integrity of the cytoskeleton. Microfilaments are solid polymerized rods of actin. And microtubules are hollow polymerized tubu uh, hollow polymer polymers excuse me, of tubulin that make up kinesin, uh, dynin, cilia, and flagella. Very, very important very high yield to know. So let's now uh, talk about high yield MCAT questions that you need to know. We've talked about the facts. We've gone over a lot of stuff from the last two videos, this video and the last video. So let's just go dive deep into these questions. If you guys want to read, read the question, pause the video, and then come back. We're going to go ahead and answer the question, go and work it out with you guys. So let's start off with question number one. Researchers are studying functions of the human body and have realized that the liver has a very specific function when it comes to toxins. Which feature, or what feature of the liver aids in its specific function? Go ahead, pause the video, read the answers, and then come back. Okay, so the right answer, the answer to this question is D, high expressivity of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Keep in mind we're talking about toxins, right? The liver plays a huge role in detoxification, and which organelle plays a huge role in detoxification in the cell? It's a smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So it's really easy to get this mixed up with C and E because obviously they clean up the cell, they play a huge role with their lysozymes, but... The right answer is S-E-R because the liver and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum have the same function. And fun fact, the liver does have a lot of smooth endoplasmic reticulum uh, in its cells, in the hepatocytes. Next question. Question number two. You look under a microscope and notice an organelle with small round circular DNA. Soon after, you realize that the encasing structure has started to dematerialize. What event released the substance that mediated this chain of events? Pause the video, read the answers, and come back. Okay, so the right answer is going to be D, damage the cell membrane. Which cell membrane specifically? It's going to be uh, side of, It's going to be the actual uh, um, uh, cell membrane itself of the mitochondria. So what is happening here? Well, number one, you looked into the cell, you saw small circular round DNA. Obviously, we're not talking about prokaryotes. Realistically, in the context of this question, we're talking about eukaryotes. And which structure has small round circular DNA? It is the mitochondria. Now, soon after, you realize that the encasing structure, meaning the cell, has started to dematerialize. What does that mean? That means the cell is going through apoptosis. So what event released the what event 
released a substance that mediated this chain of events. What happened was the cell membrane got damaged uh, in the mitochondria. And when the outer membrane got damaged in the mitochondria, it released something called cytochrome C. Cytochrome C got released and it induced apoptosis, hence why you're seeing the dematerialization of the encasing structure, aka the cell. This is a very confusing question and we did this on purpose to trick you, to make you realize that there is a lot of information that's being given to you. You're getting asked a convoluted question. You need to simplify it, dumb it down, and look at what's happening. Essentially, the damage to the cell membrane is occurring due to uh, uh, any damage, which is releasing cytochrome C, leading to apoptosis. Next question. As a medical student, you learn that herpes simplex virus can remain dormant in the ganglia of the cells. During immune compromised states, the virus can leave the cell and travel to the skin where it can present with painful papules. What cell structural component plays an important role in this? Pause the, pause the video, answer the question, and come back. All right, the right answer is C, kinesin. Now, you don't really need to know anything about herpes. And I know I told you guys about herpes uh, in this video, but you really don't need to know anything. What you need to know is a function of microtubules and what's happening. Now, this is not going to be due to flagella, cilia, or tubulin. We are talking about uh, uh, kinesin and dynin. And remember, dynin, uh, the way I remember that is you want to dine in the cell body with dynin. So if you're going towards the cell body, if you're going towards the neuron, uh, the neuronal cell body, that means it's going to be in a dormant uh, position. Therefore, it's not going to be dynin. It's actually going to be kinesin. And kinesin helps with the movement of HSV towards the periphery. All right, question number four. In your bio class, you're looking at a cell through the microscope. You notice that there is a small, dense structure in the periphery of the cell. What is housed in the cellular structure? Go ahead, pause the video, and come back. All right, so the right answer to this question is B, DNA. So it's not going to be any of these three. None of these three make sense. mRNA is not housed there. MT, mitochondrial RNA, is in mitochondria, so that is obviously out. And tRNA is also out. That is in the, uh, the cytoplasm. The two questions, the two answers I can throw you off is rRNA and DNA. Now, rRNA is not the right answer because it's not housed in the cell structure. It's actually created there and then it gets released. The right answer is going to be DNA. Remember, DNA is located in the nucleus until it needs to be unwound and uh, uh, it needs to replicate or express a gene. Question number five, which structures are involved in cell-mediated death? Go ahead, pause the video, and then uh, uh, come back. Okay, so the right answer to this is G, all of the above. We're talking about cell-mediated death. So the nucleus and nucleolus are very important because they're controlling the cell. They can give out the signal to kill the cell to go through apoptosis. Mitochondria, very important because if there is any damage to the mitochondrial membrane, you will release cytochrome C and that will cause the cell to go through apoptosis. And lysosome, lysosomes can, are, play a huge role because they also uh, are uh, very important in apoptosis due to the fact that they have lysozymes in them that can cause auto degradation of the cell. That's why all the above is the answer. And then question number six, how many microtubules are present in cilia or flagella? Go ahead, pause the, the video and then come back. Okay, so this is a trick question, guys. If you guys got this right, good job. The right answer is 20. Why is the right answer 20? Well, think about this. Remember, we said nine doublets with two central microtubules. Nine doublets. That means one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine doublets, you have 18. And then you have two central microtubules, okay? That's 18 plus two, which means 20. You have 20 microtubules in cilia and flagella. Very easy to confuse that up. It's just a dumb question you can be asked, so you should just know it in the back of your mind. With that being said, thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel for more videos. 
You can follow us on Instagram at mad.medicine, on Twitter at It's Mad Medicine, and on TikTok, baby, at Mad Medicine. Again, thank you so much for watching, and we'll hope to see you back here soon.